Hello, everyone. This is Randy Malden with Supply Leaders Academy. And today I'm here with my special guest, Captain Howard Knapp. He's also in the National Guard. So he wears kind of two hats, a citizen soldier. He's in a zoot during the week and during the weekends. And when he's called up, he's in uniforms. So we'll be presenting today on supply chain resiliency or resilient supply chains. How do we create resilient supply chains? As you know, my background, I was in the Marine Corps for over 20 years in various positions. The last part or last half of my career was very much on the logistics supply chain side, where I actually earned my doctorate in business administration on a ship deployed overseas. So part of my job was to build supply chains that could operate in austere environments. And my special guest today is Captain Howard Knapp, who's currently serving in the California Army National Guard. So, Howard, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, everybody. Captain Howard Knapp here, uh, California Army National Guard. Uh, first started my career off at Auburn University, where I got my supply chain management degree. I've uh, been in the military for over 10 years now. I've played multiple roles. I've been a battalion logistics officer. I've been a company commander for three and a half years, uh, commanding a transportation unit. I've also been a brigade logistics officer. Um, and that was my last previous position. So and what are you doing now on the civilian side? What are you doing now? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so um, so for over six years, I was at a company called Ontic, which manufactures military and civilian aircraft components. I've been in positions such as inventory control supervisor. I've been a production supervisor. I've also been a buyer for over a little under two years. And I recently, last week, just started my new job as a buyer in Moak Space and Defense Group. We're buying for commercial and um, military satellite components. Okay. And when you're when you say you're a buyer, that really when you're working with vendors, you're establishing the entire supply chain for that specific category or for that vendor specifically to make sure they deliver your stuff to you on time. Just like so, it's not just one piece. You actually look at the entire supply chain for that one component. Is that a fair statement? That's right. Okay. All right. Cool. Very good. You know, so as I said, everyone, you know, Captain and Howard, I'm gonna call him Howard. Howard and I have been working together for, for a long time. Actually, we've known each other for almost a year now, and we started working together through RFX Academy, creating this program as, you know, we're kind of building it. And then when this opportunity came to help people understand what a resilient supply chain is and how to build that for their business, we felt that we had a special skill set that we could bring to the table to translate what we've learned on the military side into what you need to know on the civilian side to have a resilient supply chain, a supply chain that can operate in any environment. And in our current situation, I would say that any environment is changing every day. And so you really need to understand the components of your supply chain, which we'll talk about how to develop a resilient supply chain and how to build these things so that you, you're successful all the time, all the time. So let's go ahead and go through our agenda. What we're going to do tonight or today or sometime, however you want to look at it, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the links of the supply chain. We're going to talk about the elements of a resilient supply chain. We're going to understand how logistics is the hidden weak link in your sourcing strategy that even though you're spending time getting the right price that sometimes logistics can sneak up on you and bite you on the backside because it's something that we don't control. We don't think about a lot of times when we're developing our supply chains. And then finally, we're going to wrap around and talk about the government and how it can really hurt you in times like this and also how it could possibly help your business if you're in the right position for what you need to know and you're able to help support the government in their efforts during times like this. And then all of this is sitting on top of the lifeline framework that you need to thoroughly understand not only about your supply chain and your organization, but also your vendor's supply chain and your customer supply chain. Understand all the different elements of the life links that support a local community and then build your supply chain so it can operate within anything that's happening at that time. This is a mind map of what we're going to talk about today. And if you'd like a copy of that mind map, just shoot me an email at randy at cpsmtraining.com. What I'll do is I'll shoot you an email to register for OYA, A-Y-O-A. Once you register, get your account, then what I'll do is shoot you over a link to this mind map here. And you can see that in OYA and actually use it, comment on it, invite your colleagues to it, comment on it. It's a really good, powerful program. It's a mind mapping program that we use. So I just want to share that with you. I'll be happy to give you the mind map. You just got to 
you know, use that OEA link. And the first thing we're going to talk about as we get rolling here, and Howard, anytime I say something, you know, if you feel the, a story or something you want to share with folks, just let me know. And I may reach out to you a couple of times just to kind of ask what you're thinking, because I know I'm, I, I'm, I, I know a lot of things, but I don't know everything. And having someone else uh, have a different perspective on things, that, that definitely is going to help. So everyone, I hope you enjoy our presentation today. We're looking forward to sharing this with you. And then following up, this is I'll let you know more about how we're building out a new course for everyone to actually learn the details of the things we're talking about tonight and actually apply it to their business. Now, first thing I want to talk about is supply chain management. Now, a lot of folks have very complicated, wordy, texty type definitions for supply chain. And I just narrowed down to the five R's, the right stuff in the right place at the right time, the right quantity and the right quality. And everything you're doing to achieve those five things is supply chain management. All the processes you're managing, all the different areas of your vendors, your categories, areas of your business, just to achieve those results. And one point I like to make when we're talking about this particular part is that procurement supply chain is a supporting function, not a supported function, meaning we're there to help other people be successful and give them the resources so they can execute what they need to execute. We're not there to demand that they follow our policies because we're in control of the resources. The resources are there to help people not get in the way of them doing their job. The fundamental elements of a supply chain, what we have for them, you have supply nodes, demand nodes, tiers, and links. Now, supply nodes are where you get your resources. Demand nodes are those things that are demanding or asking for those resources. Tiers, you have different levels of tiers. So a tier tier one supplier would be that direct supplier directly that you're ordering directly from. A tier two supplier would be that supplier supplier. And a tier three supplier would be the supplier 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 and so on and so on. And that's where you get the many different levels of the tiers. And the links are those things that connect the different nodes along the supply chain. Here's an illustration of, of the different tiers in a supply chain. You have the customer, your distributor, processors, producer, producers, processors, the distributor, the actual suppliers, tier one, the one you're ordering from, and then the tier two are the suppliers that are ordering for, the supplier suppliers, the one that they're ordering for. So in the first part of this entire process, when we get ready to talk about resilient supply chains here coming up, that's what Howard's gonna share with us, is that you need to understand all the different tiers. When you're mapping out your supply chain, that's what you're going to do is map down all the way to the lowest tier possible, down to the raw materials of things that affect your supply chain. And a good example of that that we have here is the fuel supply chain. And this is a good graphic that you can, you can find. And what this illustrates is how the supply chain for fuel is set up and it starts with the raw materials pulling it out of the ground and it goes to the processing stages or refining stages all the way through down to the actual end users and here as you can see we'll go through a couple slides here get a little bit closer you can see all the different uses of oil type products arrows are multi-directional especially for you know like a, a cash flow and with the links of the supply chain and how that's important very uh, good, yeah. Sure that, all, that everyone in the supply chain is operating together you know, in harmony because one little mislink in that link, you know, one little break in that link of the supply chain can have drastic effects for the for ultimately who's responsible is the customer you know, for right. the one that gets impacted. So that's definitely important, right, sir? It, absolutely. And that, that's and that's a great point in that, you know, you're looking at these arrows that, that Howard's talking about here, the green arrows, and it shows the, the different directions of how things are flowing and what things are flowing or what color are those arrows. If you look down here, you can see what they're talking about here, the links, the product flow, the cash flow, and then the information flow. And as Howard mentioned before, anything that breaks in these links mm -hmm. can cause catastrophic effects. And, you know, think about product flow. Damn, I have to get my stuff and information. Yes, I got to give information. But this little piece down here, cash flow, you know, a lot of times it's overlooked, especially by these big companies where they're leveraging and they have strategies to make their books look good to give their 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 stock more value. So they want to keep cash. Well, the further down the supply chain, you get smaller and smaller suppliers who are relying on that cash. And as we can see now in the current situation, how their reliance on that cash. So if these big companies haven't been paying their bills, 
and these other smaller companies haven't been able to receive that cash and they're struggling waiting to receive that cash, you know, how it can all kind of fall apart real quick. Because imagine any one of these tier two suppliers falls out and now it affects a tier one supplier, which ultimately affects you yeah. and your supply. And then the customer doesn't get what they want. And what the customer is going to do is what? They're going to leave. They're going to find somebody else who can give them what they need and what they want. So it's something to definitely keep in mind. So great point. Yeah, I'm glad you glad you put that, Thanks, brought sir. that out. You know, we can pull that out. And then we'll take this this example here and actually look at it when we look at the, the petroleum side. You know, and the first level that we talked about is the base material, pulling it out of the ground. Everything it takes to find the oil in the ground, identifying where it is, putting people on the ground, building the pumps, producing the pumps, and then getting it somehow, some way to the next stage in the supply chain and how that's going to work and getting it there. And what I like to, this is a great slide, kind of illustrates the different modes of transportation here. You got rail, truck, pipeline, shipping, all of these are different modes to move things. So that's another thing you want to look at when you're mapping your supply chain is not only where the different suppliers are, but the modes of transportation to move their stuff to you and then to move your stuff to your customer. You know, that's a part of mapping it out. And then here's the different stages of where it goes as we're developing and processing the fuel into something we can actually use. Moving it, again, the modes of transportation, refining it, storing it, selling it, point of sale, gas, airlines, power points, power plants, power points. <laughs> Imagine what I've been doing all day. <laughs> <laughs> power plants, moving the fuel, getting it all, all there. And then finally, it gets down into even further distribution. Okay. So that kind of gives you an idea on how to map out your supply chain, which again, you know, Raul's going to talk about this in a few steps here about the process of building a resilient supply chain. And so that's what we want to talk about here. And the one example I wanted to bring up before we went to resilient supply chain is, you know, the, the big thing in the news with the COVID-19 has been the antibiotic supply chain, how China owns 97% of the active pharmaceutical agreement, ingredient the API. And this kind of shows us our supply chain very in a very simple way. I know it's very simple. The customer, the ultimate person using that medication. And how does it get to them? Through the retailer, a pharmacy, or a hospital. A distributor has to get it to them. And then a manufacturer has to manufacture those chemo those things into the actual pharmaceutical antibiotic that you're looking for. And all this takes time. And the key ingredient that is controlled by one country, 97% is controlled by one country, China is right here, the active ingredient in the antibiotic. So I bring this example up because it's currently in the media, but also when you're looking at your supply chain, you wanna look for these types of weaknesses because this will be the weak link in your supply chain that can shut the whole thing down. And if it's not right, if it's not correct, or you overlook it and all of a sudden you're in a situation then you need a specific ingredient, a specific part, and only one or two people make it, then you're, you're in a bad situation and you don't want to be in that situation. So that's part of building a resilient supply chain is knowing every bit of it all the way down to the lowest, rawest form possible and all the control points along that part. And to make sure you have that information so that when you hear in the news that they're having an oil discussion like Russia and Saudi Arabia were having this last couple of weeks negotiating oil, now that affects looking over here at our site at our at our at our slide here, pharmaceuticals, plastics, organic chemicals, refined gases, lubrication, airlines, power points, our own gas consumption. That one little piece, two countries way over on the other side of the world, can affect everything in a small supply chain. So you want to be Sorry, aware of it. Again, I said it again. I keep saying PowerPoint. Okay, I said power <laughs> plant. All right. So, you know, think about your supply chain, the different ways to map it. And I've demonstrated those here. And what I'm going to talk, what I'm not going to talk about next is what Howard's going to talk about is actually building a resilient supply chain and the process you're going to go through to build that resilient supply chain. So, Howard, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? Hey, everybody. Howard again. So, first question is, so by the way, sir, real quick, how do we do the change slides? Just tell you change you slide. <laughs> okay. And then you'll Just edit it. Slide. Yeah. So, next slide. Hey everybody, Howard here. So what is resilience and why is it important for your supply chain? Right now with COVID-19, the need for a supply chain that can operate and continue operating is very important. 
think about it right now. There's disarray. There's a lack of manpower. There's lack of resources, like Dr. Randy said, with China. There's priority issues. And there's heavily extended lead times. Imagine when you're ordering stuff on Amazon. It used to take a day or two days. They were so proud of. Now it's taking three to four weeks. But what exactly is resilience? So here's the literal definition. It is the capacity to recover or spring back into shape quickly from difficulties. But for a supply chain, resilience pertains to how a supply chain continues to operate or gene during or after a crisis. But if you're like most supply chain professionals, you've never taken the time to think about a crisis and the major impacts they can have on a healthy operating supply chain. In the military, we are constantly evaluating situations and develop developing primary and even backup plans for minor and catastrophic events. Actually, while I was a company commander, I would have my platoons conduct re resupply missions and I'd hit the convoys with unexpected situations, unexpected situations, such as improvised explosive devices, also known as IEDs. We would review what are the actions that each person in the convoy needs to take. Think about it, just like in a supply chain, Everyone has their own specific actions to take, and all of those links are important for the entire supply chain as a whole. With that, there's a five-phase approach that can be used to analyze and improve your supply chain. So in the first phase of this approach, the goal is to see the strategic or the big picture of your supply chain. In this step, really map out your entire supply chain. You can create a process flow from raw material all the way to the end customer. It is very important to know where your materials and suppliers are located. Like we said earlier, a disruption could have a major impact on your supply chain operations. The material controlled by another country may have a different priority than yours. So look for primary suppliers and supply nodes, such as manufacturers, suppliers, and distributors. Going back to the nodes, think about the infrastructure, such as the roads, and even the communication channels that support them. Everyone has a critical role in supply chain. So in, the second so in the second phase, analyze your findings from the first phase. Identify and prioritize the importance of specific suppliers and nodes. Basically figure out who's crucial to your supply chain's operation. Figure out who will have a critical piece in keeping your supply chain resilient. And then this will give you the opportunity to really assess their capabilities. A lot of people don't think about is, think about how your supply chain or that specific supplier operates under normal operation. Then take it the next step, you know, analyze the situation, how, what is realistic under restricted conditions. But most importantly, by this phase, you should really point out who you want to coordinate and synchronize your plans with. There will be what you would want to call your key stakeholders, which leads us into the third phase. So in phase one and two, a resilience plan was formed. Share and vet it. This is a great time to hold targeted meetings with those stakeholders. Reach out to them that you have identified and review your findings and begin discussions and get their thoughts and their concerns. While I was actually commanding officer again for a first response unit that was responsible for personal transportation and commodity movement during a California emergency, my company would have our own internal plans and standard operating procedures. But one thing we didn't think about was we're about the infantry units that we were supporting and tasked to actually pick up. They would have their own internal plans and everything would just fall apart. But that's why it's critical especially in the joint operations, such as supply chain, that our plans were shared with each other and we could have synchronization. And by doing so, we had a better understanding of ours and their operation and how ultimately it fit into our supply chain. So now you have mapped out your supply chain, identified and prioritized your stakeholders and synchronized your plans, which leads us to the fourth phase, which is known as the action phase. This is what we call in the military rehearsals and wargaming of developed plans. Basically, reviewing what actions to take while following your resilience plan. For example, on our yearly training schedules, when I was a brigade logistics officer in the 2224 
Sustainment Brigade, we would specifically designate one training weekend to conduct joint operations with our fellow government agencies, such as police and medical personnel. Think about it. They have different radios. They have different lingo. They even have their own sta different standard operating procedures. And when we get together in an emergency, that wouldn't be the time to figure out how they operate and how we operate. It'd be essential that everything was in place, that everything was rehearsed. So we would war game and would go over different scenarios, such as an earthquake, which is something we have to deal with in Southern California. And we went through it step by step. We would discuss every scenario we could possibly think of from the moment the earthquake hit, who contacts who, who's in charge, how do we pay, and even how do we communicate. So remember, a de developed plan is great on paper, but go through the motion step by step with your stakeholders and ensure understanding between all parties and identify any potential issues and inconsistencies. Supply chain is not just dependent on one person, but the synchronized operation of the entire chain as a whole, which leads us to our fifth and final phase, which is actually the easiest to forget about. Remember, supply chains are evolving quickly. So don't forget to have continuous collaboration with your stakeholders. Don't just go do it one time and then that's it and forget. You know, if things change and you re rehearse things, you need to go back and rehearse it. You need to review and refine your data and continuously analyze and update existing plans. But I think the most important out of all of this is to maintain those relationships with those you have built. Really good. And a couple points on things that you, you mentioned, that, you know, the coordination with key stakeholders, cross collaboration. We speak about it in terms of a joint operation in the military where we're operating with different units or we're operating from different services who we know use different types of equipment, different types of uh, radio frequencies, those type of things. And in our business world, it's always a joint operation because you're working with vendors who have their own priorities. And those vendors are working with customers and suppliers who also have their own priorities. So the steps that you've talked about and, and just going through it, as simple as it may be, simple to say, complicated to execute, is sitting down and identifying the map, analyzing the different phases, reaching out. I mean, that was such a great key point. And you mentioned it a couple of times. And I heard you mention that you, you, you were coordinating with your company and that you arrived to pick up units who then had their own plan too. They had their own priority. So you thought you were going to do one thing and then showed up and then had to do something else. Can you share more about that? What, what was the situation exactly? Yes, sir. So being what we call a tier one response unit, uh, especially for the fires is another example. Uh, we were tasked with picking up infantry units who are actually the people that provided the capacity or the manpower to dig ditches, to do uh, fire breaks, to help the firefighters in any way that they could. So us as a transportation unit that has all the trucks, that has all the equipment, we were tasked with actually going to different parts of Los Angeles and picking up these different uh, companies within a uh, logistics battalion, I mean, in an infantry battalion. Um, so we would pick them up and drop them off to wherever they needed to go. Well, that sounds easy peasy when, you know, so that sounds easy and peasy, you know, just going and picking up somebody, you go pick up your friends and you drop them off. Well, it's not that simple in the military. You think about it, they have their gear, they have their water, they have their food. Um, we're in big trucks where you can't, going through the little streets of LA where you can't simply just turn around. So what we have to do is figure out how we're approaching, how are we picking them up? You know, where are they going to go? What's the response time? What frequency channel on the radio are we going to use? When can they expect us? You know, every single piece of the pie needs to be thought of. And, and it's really important too, even when you're doing your uh, resilience planning, think of every single piece of information that you can and be precise as you can. So that when something happens, you already have a plan in place. You have a process in place that you can easily go to and execute on. If you go there willy nilly, you know, that's worse than if you actually have a plan. At least with a plan, you have a fighting chance. Right. That's what we were doing, sir. Yeah, and, and you mentioned you had a plan, you know, and you're coordinating with those other units and all around you 
there's all this other activities going on. You got civilians moving on the streets. You got police and fire moving on the streets. You got ambulances doing all this stuff. These roads, as you mentioned, can only handle so much width, so much height. Bridges are only so tall. There's only so much weight the roads can handle. All this stuff, all of that has to be thought out. And like you said, you plan it out before. So when you actually start to move, you can slow, you can quickly make mi minor adjustments versus, hey, this bridge is just too short. We can't go around it. Well, you probably already looked at five other routes that you could go and say, okay, shift right, move right, move to route, route red, you know, from blue to red. And you can actually call that in and tell your commander and then he'll know exactly what you're doing. Because that and commander is also receiving all that other stuff, right? Yes, sir. Right? And even in an emergency, uh, you know, one last thing to think about definitely helps you know like you say in an emergency there's so many things going on and you shouldn't be trying to sit there trying to plan out the little minute details those should already be figured out so that you can execute it if there's any kind of change in your plan you should be focusing on tweaking that plan not totally making up a new plan and then so all the all the business folks that are, are are listening now to this and saying why does this apply to me why do i need to worry about it if you were caught short when this thing kicked off, the COVID-19 scenario started to kick off and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? That's where you made your mistake. You never thought that it could ever happen. And the planning process, the sitting down and thinking through this stuff, all you're doing is burning brain cells and electrons. You're sitting in a room with some Cokes and some Dr. Peppers, eating pizza, just talking through these scenarios. What would happen? Last year, I was at a conference with uh, dairy producers. And they were talking about how a major flood washed out a major bridge that forced that dairy producing company now had to drive three hours around to get back to where they had originally gone because that one road was washed out. In our discussions, when we were doing our tabletop exercises, when we talked about, you know, the, the assessing and the refining, the doing the tabletop exercise, exercising the plan or thinking about what we could do, you know, there's a means that then the army can do it. They're very good at just throwing up a bridge. I mean, not saying the army is going to show up and throw up a bridge for that company, but somebody could do it and they can have that contract already in place, ready to go, trigger, make a phone call. It's up, it's running, it's ready to go. Instead of being out of commission for a year waiting to rebuild the bridge, they already have a plan to put a temporary bridge in place because they sat down and they thought about it. So, you know, the, 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 in all of this stuff, the supply chain I talked about earlier, the resilient planning process, all of that is built on the lifeline framework that we're getting ready to go through. And then, you know, Howard and I are going to kind of exchange ideas as we go through each phase or different pieces of the framework. And what you want to think about is not only about you and what you need but also what your vendors need and also what your customers need. And then think this is the bonus at the end is how do I make a situation like this actually profitable? How can I offer services to the government when they need it? Am I permitted to be a contractor? You know, have I set up? Am I registered? Have I gone through the process? So this is the different framework you're going to build your resilient supply chain plan on. Our supply chain resilience is all going to be built on this framework. You're going to do the mapping process, the analysis, and these are the different things that you're looking at. Sustenance, food, water, shelter. Can your people survive? Do you have water available? You know, Howard was talking before about how they went to pick up the infantry and how they're going to have their own food, their own water, their own equipment. What happens when you show up and they don't have food and water because you're the logistics company, you're supposed to provide that. Did that ever happen? And so as a logistics battalion, we not only had to bring enough for us to survive in an operation, we also had to bring enough for everybody else. So we had to ask that question, how many people are going to be in that area of operation? So as a company, as a business, you need to run your own factory, your own facility. Do you have enough water for your own people and or your customers? They might come to you for water. Your vendors, if they show up on site, you know, PPE, PPE personal protective equipment. That's been something that people have talked about. We'll talk about a little bit later. So, you know, thinking about you know, that framework, this is the very basic step for step one. How do I survive? How do I live in this situation? Next will be at security. Uh, Howard, when it comes to security, what are some of the things that you've experienced on the military side when it comes to an operation? What are some of the things you think about? Well, the, the major one for me would be definitely physical security. You know, definitely, how is the convoy secure? Um, you know, people are going to come take your stuff. Even now the cybersecurity, you know, is everything secure? Uh, when we're talking on the radios, is the enemy able to hear us? 
You know, are they listening in our plans? Are they going to be, you know, what we're doing before we actually do it? And even down to sustenance, you know, making sure that we have the food and water, like you're saying, for, you know, our entire military operation, not for just the military operation, but we also think about it a little bit ahead, you know, bring a little bit more. So if something does happen, going back to resilience planning, you know, right. do we have a little extra? Do we have more food than we need, more water than we need? If the mission goes longer than we think it's going to go, you know, we want to be caught flat-footed and not have the water and the food and everything else that we need to continue the mission. Absolutely. And, and, and you talk about you're in the National Guard in California and you're driving in the streets of L.A. to support a fire to help the local population. In those situations, the military, you are the ones that have stuff. And then you have an entire population that you're driving around that does not have stuff and they need stuff. And I've said this before, you know, to other people in other conversations is you haven't seen people get crazy till they're hungry and thirsty and they need to eat and drink water. And if you walk into that situation and you're the only one that has water, they don't care if you're in the military, they need water and they're going to come get it. So when talking about physical security, be prepared for that. Make sure your own stuff is secure or you have a means of providing others with stuff, some kind of alternative, give them something else to think about. And that kind of goes right along with safety. We talked about personal protective equipment with the COVID-19, making sure you got the right mask and the face mask, the uh, the social distancing, as we start to develop vaccines and, and medication, making sure that's available. Uh, you know, so we want to definitely think about that. You know, another area is the health, you know, uh, it, it, when in the military, you know, Howard, one of the things we would do before we deployed is everybody went through a medical assessment. What was that experience like for you on the National Guard side? Same thing. So every year we have a physical health assessment called PHA uh, annually. This is very important too, also for the military right, to have a, a healthy fighting force. You know, one of, one of the issues actually we did have is during these annual physicals, uh, there'd be people who weren't fit to serve the one that we call them non-medically deployable. And they got to even, I think, 30%, 40% of the force was starting to be medically non-deployable. So definitely having a good, healthy, you know, fighting force is essential in the sense to winning a war, winning a battle. You can't yeah. send people out there that are sick, that, you know, <laughs> need some kind of support later uh, and yeah. fighting wars. Uh, simple as a toothache, believe it or not. We would go and we would do our medical okay. assessments and dental was a big one in there because you can okay. be in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden you have a cavity. <laughs> It's, it. a, it's a showstopper. It's a mission mission over. We, everyone's coming out of the field because one guy has a bad tooth and he can't function. You know, he's you know he's in pain. He's he's, he's at risk if that infection gets in the wrong parts of his body, it could kill him. You know, all those different things. So assessing when you know when we're talking about here the framework for for our business folks and everyone is one you, the current situation disease. You know, what is the disease? How is it impacting? You know, they're still figuring that stuff out. The human side of this death and recovery infection. You can look on the news and see in all the different rates out there. What's the risk group, you know, you know, the elderly and, and you know, that's a big risk group. So how do we isolate those folks as a military unit, say the national guard is activated to go in and evacuate people. Well, you have elderly people who may not, who may be exceptionally percept, you know, going to be you know, affected by this disease, but yet as a army, you're, you, you, as a person, you're already inoculated, you're, you have, you're immune to it, but you can bring it with you. So what's that process? How do you make sure you don't contaminate someone you're trying to help? And then animals, that's always a big one. And we see that a lot in Florida when you have the hurricanes come and everyone evacuates to a shelter. Shelters are designated as animal shelters, meaning you can bring your dog. Yeah, but we in a situation like this COVID-19 where animals could possibly be a carrier. Now, what do you do? How do you talk to people and say, hey, you have to leave your dog at home? Or now you have an emotional factor. All these things you have to kind of take into mind. So the health of people. And so, again, you're thinking about your business, your vendors, because you might have a vendor who's a tier one supplier to you. And they rely on a tier two supplier who doesn't have they're a small mom and pop shop and they don't have medical health insurance. They don't have any of this stuff. They don't even think about this stuff. They're just a small shop. And all they care about is themselves. All they got to do is lock the door and leave. Now you're out because a tier two supplier shut down your tier one supplier and now you can't do what you need to do and that goes down to the medical care again these are things you just got to sit down and talk about kind of figure it all out kind of figure all right. it out. and you yeah. think about it too right going back to health that's one thing you don't think about in supply chain when you're physically moving 
uh, you know, when parts are going through the supply chain and health is the self care that really hits hard for me too. You know, that this COVID-19, it affects people young, old, fat, skinny. You know, at the end of the day, it's the people that have the healthier lifestyle that get the better chance of survival. And in the supply chain, you don't really know what that person's, you know, health is like or what's going on. And after an event happens, you know, something could happen. And then, now, like you said, that supplier can be shut down and that affects the entire supply chain. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later when we talk about government, working with the government. How do you become a priority supplier so you can have it actually have a business during something like this? Energy, we talked about this example and we talked in the beginning and, and, and Howard mentioned it during the resiliency phase is, you know, energy. Where is your fuel coming from? Your gas, your oil? What alternatives do you have? Uh, communication. Talked about cybersecurity way back up, you know, before cybersecurity, and that today, even though you pick up a hard line, that hard line is actually tied to the internet. So what happens when your internet goes out? That takes out your phone, your email, your everything. So you got to have alternate sources of communication: your cell phone, your computer, the old ham radio. I brought this up when I was talking about rapid response planning, and that thinking about a radio. You know, just, you know, if people don't even know how to operate radios anymore, CB radio, something that travels on the airwaves, that's not going to be uh, affected if somebody were to throw a virus into the system, something you can actually work on. Messenger, you know, uh, people, that's putting somebody on a bicycle and handwriting a message and going, you know, and sending them there, you know, and it's just thinking all that stuff out. You know, we always think that stuff out. And, you know, and Howard mentioned before about phase or rehearsals and, and doing phase rehearsals. That's where you figure that stuff out. It's like, I've got a message I got to send to X, so-and-so over there. How do I get them that message? Okay, the internet's out. So when we're doing tabletop exercises, we're kind of throwing those scenarios out at you so that you know, hey, well, now I got to think through that problem. What would I do? What would I do? How would I do that? Okay, so something to think about. You know, what were some of the challenges you faced in communicating in a urban environment in the city of Los Angeles as you guys were just moving? Did you experience a lot of communication issues? Oh, yes, sir. It'll be intermittent. Intermittent. Uh, loss of communication. We were trying to use our radios, and sometimes you wouldn't be able to reach, especially you know that infantry unit. Your buildings blocking, so you right. always have to have what is called pace, primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency uh, communication plan. And that goes back to also against resilience planning. We not only had a primary and alternate, we had you know an emergency and contingency plans all in place. So even on from cell phones to radios. You know, even just the internet, right? So there's different ways that we could communicate with each other. And we followed that plan. We already had that in place. We had primary, we had secondary frequencies. And going back to communication too, sir, I think that's also really important too. In supply chain in the military, we say that the number one important thing in the military is communication. You know, the ability to operate together in one cohesive unit for the, you know, which is ultimately whatever the mission is. And in order to do that, we have to communicate. And just like going back to supply chain, having that ever revolving supply chain now, we're ever so more heavily relying on communication. You know, with uh, supply chains or your suppliers now in different parts of the world, the only way you can really synchronize with them is through communication. Mm -hmm. And just think about, you talk about suppliers around the world, your systems placing an order. Right. Well, what if that system is overloaded, you know, or knocked out for whatever reason? And, and that system is now, how, have you ever picked up the phone and talked to that supplier? If you did pick up the phone, do you have the phone number? I mean, it sounds pretty obvious to me when I say it now, but if you think about it, when was the last time I called Amazon? I haven't, <laughs> you know, and if I wanted to, I would actually go to their website and have to do a, you know, a long process to find their phone number to call somebody. And mainly they say, you know, Hey, chat somebody here. You know, and even with technology today, a lot of your chats are with robots. So you're not even talking to a human being. So something to think about again, you know, just as as as, as Howard mentioned, is having a plan, thinking about it. What are my alternates? If I pick up if I go to the system, the system's down with my next phase, I'm gonna pick up the phone, I'm gonna call the supplier. Well, say I pick up the phone, I call the supplier and I place an order. How do I place give them payment? Do I have a credit card? Is my credit card at a limit that enables me to make a payment to that person over the phone? Or will my credit card company shut down that payment because they know that, you know, it seems like a fraudulent because they've never had a, a, you're not authorized at that level, you know, and then the supplier's got an order from you and an order from somebody else. Well, who's going to get it? The person that pays. 
If you can pay, you're going to get it. If you can't pay, then somebody else is going to get it. So you got to think through these things. It's all about OODA loop. You know, observe, orient, decide, act. Observe, orient, decide, act. And you want to do that faster than everyone else so that you have what you need to continue to move forward. Hazardous material, often very much overlooked. You know, there's, there's laws that govern this. Despite the laws and regulations, you know, the bottom line is safety. You can have a, 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 a hazmat accident that poisons a water supply or wipes out an entire block with a hazardous gas that just kind of goes down the road and takes out a lot of people. So this is something you got to think about. How do you transport it? How do you store it? Do you have the right containers? Do you have the right people that know how to handle it? If there's an accident, do you have the people that can, that can, handle, that can mop it up and they have the right, do they have the right equipment? to do that because a lot of the equipment you use to handle hazardous materials also the same equipment you need to protect yourself against the COVID-19 right so you know what's been your experience with hazardous material Howard what, what, what are some of the things you had to deal with when you were doing an operation because I know like a refuel point setting up something like that as simple as it sounds it's not as easy as it as it sounds is it that's right yep so I, I think one of the major things too to understand too about hazmat is you know is it, it also by the way is it true that you can't ship I mean, you can't on an aircraft, you can't do hazmat, right? A lot of, there are very big, there are a lot of limitations on hazmat that can go through the air, right? Like lithium batteries, a lot of us know about it because lithium batteries were in our cell phones and in our computers. And there was a, you know, a call came out whenever you go to check in the airport, they ask you, do you have any lithium batteries in your luggage? Because they need to know because they could actually explode. <laughs> and so that's right. a good example of something that most of us are familiar with where there's a limitation and what can go in the air. When I was on a deployment and we were waiting for a halon bottle in order to do an operation, well, that halon bottle could not go in an airline. It had to go on a ship and the ship takes 10 days where an airplane takes 10 hours, you know, so that's a big difference. And just knowing that time difference no, tells us that we have to we have to start 10 days before. So if we have an operation coming up, we got to make sure we get things moving so they can arrive on time. OK. Now, one of the things I was talking about, you know, just talking about hazmat or just transportation modes, we were talking about, you know, possibly a food issue with the COVID-19. If all of a sudden, you know, the food chain became contaminated for any reason, not saying that's happened or anything I know might happen. Like, well, how do you get bulk food into the United States? Well, I made some phone calls with some folks that I know are in that industry. And they said at a minimum 45 days. So from the moment you place an order to the moment you receive it, 45 days later. So question on the table, do you have 45 days worth of food to sustain until other sources from around the world can actually provide you stuff? Just a, just a question, just asking, right? You know, it's just something to ask. And that's, again, what we're doing when we talk about these things. Now, the next phase is transportation, but we're also talking about logistics. And this is what Howard's doing right now. He's like, he's moving stuff. So, so when you're thinking about framework, you know, Howard, and you're, you're actually a very good example of, a, of somebody in the military that operates between military and civilian sectors, right? You, you had to kind of, not only do you have, do you work in both sectors, but you actually operate in that theater in Los Angeles and how you, you use military operations in a civilian environment. So how does that work for you when it comes to transportation and moving stuff? What are some of the things that you come across? So two main things that hit for me, is the modes of transportation and also the infrastructure, right? So depending on what time of, type of event that happens, you know, a fire could burn down a road or, you know, an earthquake could level buildings and it won't be able to move by truck. You know, so we have to think about what currently is the situation, what kind of environment I am, and what kind of mode of transportation can I use? Just like in the military, you know, even though we have a lot of trucks, if the situation is presented, we could do, uh, other modes of transportation, such as air, we could call in a Black Hawk, get something lifted out and deliver it to wherever we need it to go. If we can't get to that, to, and the road is blocked, and I can't get to where I need to go, the only op option I would have is either rail or even by you know uh, air or rail. Right. Let me see what else there. Infrastructure capacity. Oh, okay. And also on infrastructure, you know, like going back to the capacity. We got these big trucks moving down the road. There's traffic and people trying to get out. We're trying to get in, or we're all trying to go in the same direction. That have a major impact on our military operations, especially with the convoy, 
where our intervals are important, where we're keeping our distance from each other, doing what we're trying to do, and you got cars coming in and out of traffic and going into our convoys, you know, it's things that we need to take into account as well. Yeah, all that that that's that you know that friction that that civilian factor that you're dealing with just in normal day to day operations, and it and even though the military has a perception of you'll do what I say, the reality is that the military is very civilian friendly and that we don't really push people around and tell them what to do. You know, we try to work with people and be nice, you know, and try and do all those things. And then you know, and, and so that's something we got to consider is how do you get that because you don't want to start a riot where someone is doing something and you have an accident and then all of a sudden everyone just because you're the military, they start picking on you. But then, you know, translating this back to business as well, that, you know, your reputation is going to be affected during this process. So if you have a mistake or have an accident and they just find out it's your company, then you're blamed for that issue, for that problem, for that thing that's happening, that's going to be blamed on you. So you got to think through these things. And this is also, and we're getting ready to talk about this next is logistics is the hidden weak link that even though you have everything coordinated with your suppliers, if you can't move it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So, you know, Howard, this is one of the areas that we're going to let you talk about in logistics. And so, you know, just go ahead and just, I'll, I'll let you run with it. You know, just let me know when to change the slide, go for it. Okay. So next slide. So here are the key principles of logistics that we'll be discussing. Uh, next slide, sir, probably. Yeah. So first off, what is logistics? It's defined as a function within supply chain management that deals with managing the flow of items between the point of origin all the way to the point of consumption. Basically, think about logistics as the act of moving items throughout the entire supply chain. Okay. And you also may be wondering, why is logistics important for resilience? Well, think about this. Female purchases, purchases 50 pallets of water from a local distributor. How will the water get from that distributor to FEMA's dock and to FEMA's dock and ultimately to the people who are affected by the crisis who need the water? That's right, logistics. No, it's funny During you bring up the water. Of floods in 2018, my unit was activated for personnel and commodity movement in support of FEMA's humanitarian efforts. We moved hundreds of pallets, to distribution sites across Southern and Central California to FEMA distribution points where victims could get the food and water they so desperately needed. So remember, you can buy materials and goods, but without logistics, there would be no movement. So like I said, there's supply chain management and within supply chain management, there's the art of logistics. And even within logistics, there are seven primary functions. Knowing the functions of logistics while you're making a resilience plan is vital. Well, when it comes to you know the functions of logistics, these are all the different areas. And even though order, order processing and even inventory control might sound like a procurement function, that if you look at that one place, warehousing, you got to place an order to get it out of the warehouse into the hands of the in, in, into the hands of the consumer, and that's where you have order processing and inventory control and warehousing. That's where procurement and logistics kind of help to create the supply chain procurement buys the stuff it gets stored and then logistics moves the stuff from wherever it's stored to where it needs to go and all of that has to be coordinated okay. and one of the important ones i wanted to hit was inventory control which you're seeing now which is balancing inventory and in the cost to meet customer requirements you know one thing that's hurt a lot of suppliers now during the coronavirus epidemic is just in time delivery you got companies running on lean inventory, lean manufacturing principles, and now their method, their source of supply is now cut off. And now you run out of inventory immediately and you have to figure out how to get that, uh, get all those, uh, get your resources back. Right. And, you, and, and most of us are dealing with this even in our personal lives. You know, I haven't seen I haven't seen toilet paper in the store for three weeks now, and it's getting right. to that time we got to find toilet paper somewhere. <laughs> you know, and I got family of five, you know, toilet paper is important. It's something we got to find. But that's you have inventory control. Where do I find it? How do I find it? And then and that's going to be something we have to get. Yeah, you know, something we have to. Right. Get. And it's really important to the balance, right? Sort of, like, you know, yeah. when how much is enough for just tied up capital, and there's too much in inventory, and you could use that money somewhere else. That's a great point. Have sufficient safety stock for yeah. an emergency. You know, think about how 
long will your inventory last you and what kind of situation that you're planning for you know, what effect it'll have on the inventory and you're nailing it from a business perspective and a business decision. See, in the military, we can buy it and store it because we got big places where we can store stuff and wait for that operation, right? We got pre-positioned stocks all over the world that are just sitting there being maintained and waiting for us to do it. But as a business, you got to buy it and then it sits and it waits till you use it. And if you don't use it or sell it, then you pay taxes on it at the end of the year. So there's a lot, a lot of going on, like you said, tied up capital and the resources that aren't even being used for consumer. And even though you bought it once, now you have to pay for it again comes tax season because you have valuable inventory sitting in your warehouse and all that kind of comes into play. So, you know, from a business perspective, there's also a lot of other decisions that don't affect the military because the military has, you know, unlimited resources or so they believe anyway, sometimes, you know, but from a business perspective, I don't, I've only got so much space. I've only got so much stuff. I've only got so much money. And if my money's in inventory, you know, I'm not paying for the inventory, but now I'm paying taxes on top of that inventory because I didn't use it. That's when we see the car dealers at the end of the year, where you're trying to sell their cars because they don't want to pay tax on those cars that are just sitting on the lot. They just want to get them move, moving. So good, good, good one. Definitely do. That's how it kind of ties supply chain, the logistics into the supply chain side. Yes, sir. Okay, so next slide. So when dealing with the movement of product, there's various modes of transportation that you can utilize. It each has its unique strengths as weaknesses, as you can see. So when you're resilience planning, knowing what mode or modes of transportation to use can be the difference between getting your product quickly and efficiently to not even getting it at all. So for example, during military deployments in austere environments, or even for training events, there's multiple modes of uh, transportation that might be used. So large military equipment, such as tanks and vehicles, you just don't drive it down the road and go to your next location. You know, there could be, could be transported by rail to sh and then over to a shipping yard where it's loaded on a boat or on a cargo ship, goes to the port, another port, unloaded onto a semi truck, and then deliver to wherever the army or whatever branch needs it. So you take that into consideration as well. And we'll talk a little bit later in the towards the end when we're talking about government is that you might think you have that transportation, but if the government needs it more than you do or says they do, they get it. You don't. So you have to kind of think through that situation. If all of a sudden your rail is not available, what else are you going to do? How are you going to move things? You know, and so I think that's why too, sir, it's also important to know the strengths and weaknesses of each. So if you know something happens, right? So if an earthquake happens, you probably don't want to do rails, probably going to be derailed. The roads may be jacked up. You know, having a situation, having the specific situation and knowing what the impacts it has and what modes of transportation you can utilize would be very important. For example, with air, you'll get it quick, but it's going to cost you. And there's not much volume you can use. Or with a maritime, you know, it's the most efficient from a quantity standpoint. And from a cargo load efficiency, but then its speed is slow. It's going to take a while. So knowing all those different types, you know, like I said, going back to intermodal, capitalizing on the strengths and weaknesses of each mode of transportation would be ideal for resilience planning. Right. And just thinking through it, just thinking through it. Sorry, yeah. sir. Some other logistical considerations. Yep. So on the logistical considerations. One, ex one thing to really take into account, too, is your source of supply. We say it all the time. As I stated previously, logistics can be a major point of failure, especially during a crisis. As we're all discovering during this epidemic, knowing, as we are all discovering during this epidemic, knowing where your materials are originating from and where they end up is essential. Think about it. Some suppliers may be in a location that is prone to hurricanes, such as Florida or in a politically unstable environment in another country. These details need to be considered when you're making your resilience plan. Um, next, do you want to discuss anything on here, sir? Yeah. Okay. And then also look at the routes. You know, what are your alternate routes? Are there any weight restrictions, bridge restrictions, or hazmat restrictions? For example, in the military, we have our, bigger, our big cargo trucks. When we're planning our primary and alternate supply routes, we need to take into account the bridge height. I don't know if you've been around, but I've seen a couple of times where a military truck has hit a, a sign, you know, a road sign or has hit a bridge and caused a bunch of damage because they thought they could make it underneath. 
You know, so all those little things you need to take into consideration. Going back to the civilian side, right, that'll affect your lead times too. You know, having your primary alternate routes. If you have big semi trucks and you think that it's going to go down this road and there's low bridges and you think your lead time is going to be one or two weeks, you know, definitely may affect that. And you may actually get something in three to four weeks. Right. But you have to take into those considerations. And next slide, sir. And also think about the distribution considerations, just like the other ones have secondary and tertiary points of distribution. Uh, another thing you can really think about is alternate methods of distribution. You can do something as door-to-door -door methods. You know, is there a, no, okay, hold on, sir. When thinking about distribution, think about not only where, but how your product is distributed. If your primary method of distribution stops, can you use an alternate method, say UPS or FedEx? Or maybe even use a door-to-door -door carrier, which I've personally used in the past. Uh, next slide, sir. And then also consider inventory factors. Like we were saying, having optimal inventory levels has always been a challenge for many companies, and believe it or not, even the military. Balancing having the right amount of stuff but not having too much has been one of the universe's many mysteries. In the military, especially during combat operations, the implications of a stockout can be disastrous and even lead to loss of life. So having inventory at the appropriate quantities on hand for critical missions is considered most important in the military. Uh, the other thing to note in this area is also priorities. That's right. That's right. It, what is the priority? And that's where the focus of the resources is going to go. And then the second priority, third priority, and so on down the line. And an example we can see in the current situation is that certain cities have hot spots and they have more, they have a bigger, higher priority because they have more people sick than anyone else. So they're shifting all those focuses. But as those areas calm down and other areas become hot spots again, then those resources are going to shift. So, for example, New York City needed ventilators. They staged ventilators. They were going to go everywhere to get the ventilators to New York. And then New York didn't need them. But now Michigan is becoming a hot spot. So now they're shifting all that stuff over to Michigan, Louisiana. California is luckily is stabilized. So, you know, so according to what we're seeing on the news anyway, you know, this is all information, how things are moving. So priorities are going to shift. And that's another reason to do this kind of planning. And every day you need to be doing the rapid response planning we talked about in our last presentation. For those of you who didn't see that, you know, just click the link and you'll be able to take it, take a look at that one. Every day you need to reassess your priorities and shift to the priority of the day and then think, five, 10, 20 days down the road, and then even have someone else thinking month, six months down the road, and just constantly thinking so that when someone needs something, we're already thinking about how we're going to resolve it. Or we can say, I cannot get that for you, do something else. And then they can make a decision because somebody somewhere is assuming they're going to get something and then it doesn't show up and everybody's waiting for that one thing. And then to find out you can't get it anyway. So, you know, that's definitely something to consider. What are your priorities and reassessing those priorities all the time? All I got some, sir, too. I got to go in. So, you know, one of the things we we're learning now or the medical field is learning is during the corona, before the corona epidemic, our medical supply sources or supply chain was planned and reliant on the fact that other states would be able to come and rescue them. Never has anybody thought that all 50 states would declare a state of emergency. So what the federal government has now tried to do, or it has been doing, is having more of a federal level, entire country, situational awareness of inventory. And like Dr. Randy was saying, now they're able to redirect and prioritize where equipment needs to go. You know, going back to having limited amount of resources, you know, being able to make somewhere in one hospital in Kansas or somewhere less affected has respirators available and it's just sitting there. You know, and we're in New York, where it's heavily hit, they need respirators badly, could easily reassess and redeploy equipment to where it's needed the most. You don't always necessarily need to have more, but also just managing your inventory is also a critical component. And that's and that's actually came out of the news last night that these testing machines to find out if people have the antibodies or have the virus or not, that it came out yesterday that 75 percent of the capacity was not being used by the states at the same time the states were demanding 
more testing capability. So they weren't even using the inventory they had and they were demanding more right. and demanding more. So you know, very good point is that you got to use what you have first and then fill the gaps. But you only do that when you are able to identify the gaps by through the planning and the things that we're talking about in this presentation. So good. Ooh, that's that's a good one, sir. Ooh, that was a good one. Yeah. Uh, so another thing to take into account is the transportational transportation personnel. As we're clearly seeing now, a large scale disaster a large scale disaster can cause a reduction in transportation personnel, such as truck drivers and even dispatchers. This has directly impacted lead times. And that's all I had for that. <laughs> that's a great point. You know, it's just because you have trucks doesn't mean you have drivers on the trucks. And we've had a driver challenge for many, many years because people just don't want to drive trucks anymore. They want to do something else. So, you know, the need for transportation personnel is definitely there. But do we have qualified drivers to actually drive those trucks? And you know, so people always talk, you know, yeah, always talk about supply chain and the movement of product. Well, people need to take into account or consider that there are actually people help moving these things. Even like with a virus, especially, right? People are affected and capacity is heavily affected. You can have all the machines, you can have all the trucks, but there's no one there to operate it, to program the machines or to drive the trucks. You're dead in the water. Yeah, and maintenance. You can only drive those trucks for so long before you gotta change the oil. Right. And then it takes them off the road. And if you gotta have somebody that can change oil, <laughs> you know, those are all things that we have to consider. You know, that's where logistics is that weak link in your supply chain is that you maybe even have the best contract with your vendors, the highest priority to get the stuff. But if you can't move it from point A to point B, it's just not going to be an issue. And one of the things that can affect your ability to move stuff is the government. And that's one of the things we want to talk about is why the government can be your best friend and worst enemy in times of crisis. And this slide says a lot, you know, here in Australia, Australia, OK, a, a an ally of the United States back in 2010, the H1N1 vaccine, the government pressured the vaccine maker to turn over 36 million doses of N H1N1 vaccine contracted by the U.S. So one of our allies said, U.S., you are not a priority. We are the priority for our stuff and we're going to keep it because we need it more than you. So. The point there, and there's another one right below that, even Canada, same thing, right? Canada said, hey, we get priority. We're going to keep what's made in our country for us and not give it to the U.S., even though the U.S. had the contract to get the stuff. So the point here is, one, be aware of where your supply chain sits. And even though you might, we might have a friendly relationship with that country, if that country decides that they have a higher priority, they're going to take care of themselves first. So when you're doing your supply chain mapping, you definitely want to look at that part and say, okay, yeah, we got a secure supply in the country of Canada. What happens if Canada doesn't want to give us our stuff? Where else can we go? Well, we'll go to Mexico. Well, what if Mexico says they can't do it? Well, then maybe we got to go somewhere else. You got to think about it. Or what are we going to do alternatively? If we can't get a vaccine, we can't get the things that we need because the country we we're supposed to get it from isn't letting it out of the borders. What else are we going to do? And this is when we talk about the government, all the different things that can help here. All right. And we talk about this in the training, you know, the supply chain resiliency course that we have coming up. We're going to go through all this in detail so you can really think about the government, how it can help you and how it can hurt you in any situation. All right. And also the other thing to think about is the government can be a customer. Not only can they take stuff from you, but you can sell stuff to the customer. So as a business, you want to think about that as well. Here in Florida, we have hurricanes all the time. So vendors here in Florida or anywhere we have a national disaster, you want to think about that is how, how can I offer my services to the government during the time of crisis so that I can get priority in the Defense Production Act? You've heard about this on the news. And what this is, it's a law passed to enable the government to prioritize things to where if there's a, a hazard, a natural disaster, an act of war, then they can come in and say, boom, these suppliers, these manufacturers have priority. All resources go to them to get that stuff. And we actually saw this in the news happen a couple of different ways as things were happening. 3M with masks, they had to step in Defense Production Act and say, hey, this belongs to the United States. You need to get us stuff here. 
make it happen. And they instituted this. So, but how does this work? How does all the Defense Production Act work? Is that part of the process is one, you have a, a priority rating stated by the government. The government has identified critical infrastructure that they say is a priority, and they should they put together a process to give you a DPA, a Defense Production Act priority rating. So that way, if you have a higher priority, then your contract goes to the front of the line, everyone else's contract goes to the back of the line. That's a good situation to be in if you're in the business. If you've been identified as one of those things, a critical infrastructure. How do you know if you're a critical infrastructure? One of the things you, you ask the question and then you get a rating. Your contract has to be rated before the crisis, not during the crisis. Another reason for this type of planning. The other thing is you have a voluntary agreement or voluntary rating where you feel you're part of the infrastructure and you should be critical and you have to go through the process. And the process here is request sponsors. So you have to find a government agency to sponsor you to get a DPA rating, a Defense Production Act rating. Get through approval, have your meetings, just like we talked about resiliency planning, have those meetings with the stakeholders and then get final approval. Something that's not listed here on the slide is this approval comes from the Justice Department. It's not the agency that says yes, it's the Justice Department that approves that but voluntary agreement to be put in place. Something to think about. And when you join our course, join our training, Resilient Supply Chain Management, we're gonna go through this. One, you need to know about it because of your business. How can you stay in business in a crisis? But you also wanna be aware of what your vendors can do for you, okay? And that's where we wanna go. We wanna go in to be part of discussion. So the next step for everyone is to take a look at the program we're putting together for supply chain resiliency. And if you're interested in that program, just go ahead and click the link that's in the here at the bottom of this, or we'll send out an email to give you the link and just go ahead and put your name on the waiting list. We'll be launching it here in a few days. So if you wanna be one of the first ones to get in on the program, make sure you put your name on that list so you can get first notification. It's gonna be limited. It's gonna be something we're building and we're gonna help people go through the process and build the course out so that you can be a, a resilient supply chain manager, supply chain management resilience, and be, have that capability so that when you're managing and building your categories, you have this tool in your toolkit so you, that you can be more successful. So with that, I hope everyone's had a great time. If you have any questions, go ahead and put your questions in the question box, shoot those over to us. We'll respond to them as they come in. You may not get a response here on the screen or during this presentation, but we'll send you an answer to your question. And if we get enough questions, what we'll do, just like we did with the rapid response planning, we'll put together another Q&A session and we'll go through all the questions and we'll make sure that we answer everyone's questions so they have the tools that they need to get what they need to be successful during this time. And you might say, well, hey, the crisis is almost over. I don't need to worry about it. I would offer that planning doesn't hurt. Again, brain cells and electrons. So having this knowledge, starting to plan for it will prepare you for the next issue, whatever that might be. So with that, have a wonderful day. Howard, anything else? Well, thanks, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak and talk about something that I'm very passionate about, supply chain resilience. Good, great. I look forward to working with everyone to help build your resilient supply chains and we'll talk to you soon.